hear me? Okay, good. Um, so I figured I would talk a little bit about my own story and how my Zionist activism connected to my journalism. Um, and then I thought I would talk a little, a little bit about the connection I see between Zionism and storytelling. Um, and then, you know, would love to hear questions later on from you, especially those of you who are interested in publishing more and what I think editors like me are looking for. Um, so, like I said, I, I got involved in journalism very much through activism. I was at Columbia in the years right after the Intifada, and I had spent a year in Israel uh, between high school and college, and I went to college really wanting to avoid politics completely. I was a theater geek, I wanted to do plays, I wanted to sing, and I wanted to totally avoid Israel politics because I was tired of it. Um, and that kind of changed my sophomore year when I heard about this movie that I'm sure many of you have now heard about called Columbia Unbecoming. Uh, Columbia Unbecoming was this amateur documentary which documented the stories of students at Columbia who had been bullied, essentially, by professors in the Middle East Studies Department. And the honest truth is, when I first heard rumors about this film, I was sure that it was nothing more than right-wing Hasbara. Um, and then I saw it. And what I saw was, was alarming to me. I had never before experienced anything like it. And I saw stories of, of students just like me. One of them, and for those of you who followed this story back in 2003 and 2004, you'll remember some of these. But for those of you who haven't, please bear with me. Um, so one of them was an Israeli student who I knew named Tommy Schoenfeld, and he's a former Israeli soldier, extremely left-wing. He went to a lecture uh, put on by a now infamous prof professor named Joseph Massad. And at the end of the lecture, Tommy raised his hand to ask the professor a question. And Professor Joseph Massad responded and said, are you Israeli? I hear an accent. And Tommy said, yes, I'm Israeli. And Professor Massad replied, you're Israeli, that means you served in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, and Tommy said yes. And Professor Massad then replied, why don't you tell everyone here how many Palestinians you killed? At which point the room absolutely erupted into chaos. That was one incident. Um, this, isn't, this shouldn't be surprising from a professor who, by the way, is now tenured and claims that the ultimate achievement of Israel is the transformation of the Jew in, into the anti-Semite and the Palestinian into the Jew. Another incident from the film, uh, another totally apolitical student named Dina Shankar, who was in a class also with Mossad, uh, who brought up the Janine massacre. And she raised her hand and noted the fact that even the UN had dismissed the idea that a massacre had occurred in Janine. Um, and he responded in front of a very large lecture hall, anyone who will sit through my class and deny Israeli atrocities can get out of my classroom, and demanded that she, le and demanded that she leave. George Saliba, another tenured professor, told a student that because she had green eyes, she had no claim to the land of Israel. So what this film showed so powerfully to me, uh, as a sophomore, again, not involved in politics, um, is that beyond these individual incidents of bullying, was that 30 years since Edward Said published his book Orientalism, there wasn't one professor in the Middle East Studies Department who didn't buy into his theory of the Middle East. So you have this environment of incredible intellectual orthodoxy in which Zionism is racism. And no one likes racists, so it follows logically from that that you'd want to ostracize the racists in your midst, and that's what was happening in a lot of these classes. Um, and I was shocked by what I saw in the film, but I remained somewhat skeptical. And then I went to the screening of the film on campus in which hundreds of students from all sorts of political backgrounds showed up. And the reaction to the film by the students and the teacher's assistants and the professors that showed up was shocking to me. Um, I was actually in Professor Joseph Massad's class at the time, and my TA happened to be sitting behind me, and he snickered at the Jewish students in the film. Another person got up and pointed to two boys with kippot and said, we can't tell you apart, and the whole room erupted in laughter. And the amazing thing to me was that the knee-jerk reaction on the part of the people that showed up was to side against the students, a phenomenon that never would have happened in the case of any other minority group, making even a fraction of the claims. And suddenly I, I saw that the documentary wasn't Hasbara or an exaggeration at all, and in fact things were just what the critics had said they were. So I got involved, um, I began to speak out in the student paper, I joined force, forces with a few other students who were willing to speak out and be called neoconservative, Zionist, warmongering, you name it, we were called it. Um, and I found that the most effective and rewarding way to respond to this kind of vitriol was to 
write and to write columns in the student paper. I eventually started a magazine, um, and then kind of it just kind of took off from there. And fast forward, um, I had a stint at the late great New York Sun under Seth Lipsky, who some of you maybe know, and then I went to the Wall Street Journal, where I worked for three years um, as an assistant op-ed editor and a features writer. Um, I don't know who here reads the WSJ editorial page. I hope a lot of you do. Um, but I think support of Israel is a kind of seamless part of their general worldview, which is free people and free markets. And it can often be an island of sanity for those of us that care about Zionism in Israel. And WSJ, the audience is very broad. They're trying to reach a mass audience and also shape elite opinion. And I left the WSJ in part because I wanted the chance to focus on Jewish issues, issues that are often too inside baseball for that general audience. Um, a friend made the very wise distinction that there's pro-Israel, which is advocating for Israel, and then there's pro-pro-Israel, which is kind of the inside baseball between J Street and APAC and ECI, which I'm sure Noah will talk about, and all the rest. Um, and in this case, part of the wonderful thing about being inside the shtetl, as I think of it, is that we get to weigh in in the kind of scraps that go on in that internal debate, which is something that I've really, really enjoyed, and I'm sure that we'll get to talk more about that later. So what about the connection between um, advocacy journalism or storytelling and Zionism? And I realized in thinking about this event that there's actually quite a strong one. Um, think about it, before there was an Irgun and a Palmach, there was this secular newspaper man who told a story to his fellow Jews about this thing called the State of Israel, and he even sketched a flag for it. And in 1896, this man, Theodor Herzl, uh, the son of assimilated Hungarian Jews, wrote a pamphlet called Der Judenstaat, the Jewish State, which spelled the whole thing out. And there, it's really powerful, so I'll just read from it for a moment for those of you who haven't looked it up in a while. The idea I have developed in this pamphlet is an ancient one. It is the restoration of the Jewish state. The decisive factor is our propelling force. And what is that force? The plight of the Jews. I am profoundly convinced that I am right, though I doubt whether I shall live to see myself prove so. Those who today inaugurate this movement are unlikely to see, to see its glorious culmination. But the very inauguration is enough to inspire in them a high pride and the joy of an inner liberation of their existence. The plan would seem mad if a single individual were to undertake it. But if many Jews simultaneously agree on it, it's entirely reasonable, and its achievements present no difficulties worth mentioning. The idea depends only on the number of its adherents. A year later, uh, not a year later after that, but Herzl died in, I think, 1905 um, at age 44. Um, and he, his last words, or the day before he died, his last words were, Greek Palestine for me, I gave my heart's blood for my people, which I just thought was so moving. And to me, this is kind of fundamentally what Zionism is about for me. It's about the Jewish imagination. To be in Europe in 1896 and, and project the Jewish return to political power, to project the third commonwealth, essentially, that's what Zionism is about. And I think we've heard a lot this year, for those of us who follow the inside baseball, um, from Peter Beinart and others about the crisis in Zionism. I think there is a crisis in Zionism, but I think it has to do with a crisis of Jewish memory and Jewish imagination. Um, in, in the essay that kind of shaped the book that Beinart would later write, and I disagree with his conclusions, but I think he was right to observe that we have no memory. He writes about my generation. We have no memory of the Arab armies amassed on Israel's border and of Israel surviving in part thanks to urgent military assistance from the United States. Instead, my generation has grown up viewing Israel as a regional hegemon and an occupying power, and as a result, they're more conscious than their parents of the degree to which Israeli behavior violates liberal ideals and less willing to grant Israel an exemption because its survival seems in peril. So putting aside the politics of that, I think on a basic observational level, he's right. I think many Jews my age, based on the news they get and the lack of education they have Jewishly, is extremely narrow. They view Israel as an occupying force and a regional hegemon. And as a result, I think they believe that Jews are invincible, that Israel stands, stands out mostly because of its subjugation of Palestinians, and they're, they're actually suspicious that something called the Israel lobby really does run this country. So I think that we need to think about when our people developed such short-term memory loss. When did it become true that in order to maintain our commitment to Israel and the Jewish story and to the Jewish people, we somehow have had to live through 1967. The entire Jewish project, as far as I see it, is based on never having lived through anything, but living our lives as if we have. In Jewish terms, 67 is yesterday. The real challenge is Exodus and Sinai. 
So I think without a sense of Jewish memory and history, our imaginations are crippled, and we have no perspective about our present, no imagination for what could befall us, and no ability to dream about the heights to which we could ascend. To me, without Jewish memory and imagination, there is no Zionism. And that's, I think, where the work of journalists, to some extent, come in, which is reminding people about that history and finding new Jewish heroes, Zionist heroes, and stories to tell. Um, and I think it's also about reminding people the truth of that history. Um, and I have a lot more to say about that, but I will let you know, take it over from here. <laughs>